in particular about TCP congestion control. The congestion in the internet occurs at the routers between the source and destination. Essentially the routers become overflowed. They have receiving too many packets to be able to send them out. The routers have buffers. Those packets start to queue up in the buffers. If the buffer becomes full, a packet will be dropped. So there's two problems for TCP. If a packet is dropped, we have a problem because we have to retransmit. If a packet is not dropped but has a large delay, then that's also a problem for performance. Possibly the source will still have to retransmit because it doesn't receive an act within the timeout period. So congestion in routers is bad for TCP. So the main sender of traffic in the internet the main transport protocol used is TCP. So to avoid congestion, TCP has congestion control to reduce its sending rate. <clears throat> Send less, there should be less congestion. It has some algorithms for how to limit its sending rate. It perceives network congestion because of packet loss. If we have a timeout or if we receive three duplicate acts, we believe that there's increased congestion, so we'll slow down. If we start to receive acts, we believe that there is decreased congestion, so we can speed up our sending. So we have a dynamic algorithm of increasing and reducing our sending rate. One of the exam questions was a, a very simple one was what's the difference or explain the congestion window and the, and the advertised window. Congestion window is about, is, controls the sending rate of the source such that it doesn't cause, or such that we don't cause congestion in the, in, in the internet for congestion control. Advertised window is used for flow control. It's not about congestion. Flow control, remember, is making sure we don't overflow the receiver. The receiver has a buffer as well. And that's different from congestion. So two different aspects there. The amount of data we can send from a TCP source is the minimum of those two windows. So they're just variables that your source, your computer has two variables, an advertised window and a congestion window keeps track of those variables and the TCP when it sends data it looks and takes the minimum of those two to see how much it's allowed to send. We perceive network congestion due to packet loss, increased congestion due to packet loss, decreased due to arrival of acts. And there are different mechanisms for increasing and reducing our sending rate. We want to increase it as fast as possible so that we get a higher throughput, but we don't want to increase it too fast such that we cause congestion and cause packets to be dropped. So that's why they have different algorithms for different phases. And perhaps these diagrams, wherever they are, illustrate them the best. At the start of our connection, when we establish a connection to some server, we start at a very small sending rate with a small window send some data. If we start to receive acts, then that means that there's no congestion, so we send at a faster rate by increasing our window. And we increase at an exponential rate. In the slow start phase, when we start our connection, we increase not slowly, but fastly our sending rate. So we see this exponential increase because when we start the connection at a slow speed, we don't expect to receive uh, to have any congestion in the network. So start slowly, increase rapidly until we get to some threshold, which is again a parameter in your computer. It can be changed in your computer. It's just a part of the operating system. It tells us when to switch between this fast increase to a slower increase, just an additive increase in our window. So we have two different algorithms there for increasing the window. Of course, our congestion window may go higher and higher and higher, but the sending rate 
depends upon the minimum of the congestion window and the advertised window. So if the advertised window is in this example at 24,000 bytes, if the congestion window reaches 25,000, 26,000, the sending rate is influenced by the advertised window, not the congestion window. We take the minimum of the two to determine how much we're allowed to send. In your exam question, there was a question which is to draw a diagram similar to this, but saying, what did it say? Uh, the first one, no packet loss, even easier. The first one, no packet loss, and assuming the receiver has infinite buffer. If the receiver has an infinite buffer, then the receiver, when it tells the sender how much space is available in the buffer, is infinite. That is, we could say that the advertised window is infinite in that theoretical example. That is, the advertised window is very high. In this example, the advertised window is at 24,000 bytes. If, as in your exam question, it was infinite up here, then the plot you'll get is the slow start followed by just a, a linear increase in additive increase. And that's all you had to draw in your exam to recognise that you start with this exponential increase in slow start phase, you meet some threshold and then go in a linear increase. That's how we increase the, the window. Of course, if we have a packet loss, we decrease the window. And there are two types of packet loss events. The worst packet loss event is if we have a timeout. <coughs> TCP has a retransmission mechanism that is if we send our packet, we don't receive an act within some timeout or within some time interval, we retransmit. But it has a, we can think of it as an improved mechanism. If we send multiple packets, which we normally do, because our window allows us to send multiple packets, except usually at the start. If we send multiple packets, we'd like to receive multiple acknowledgements. If we start to receive duplicate acts, it is an indicator that one of our packets that we sent got through, or some of the packets we sent got through, but possibly one did not. And that's an indicator that, well, maybe one packet has been lost in the network. There's a small amount of congestion. So if we retransmit due to three duplicate acts, that's an indicator for a small amount of congestion. The worst case is if we don't receive any acts. All packets are lost. <laughs> if we don't receive any acts, then that's an indicator that many packets are lost and there's much more congestion. So we respond differently. And that was the last question in the exam. How do you, why do you respond differently? Loss due to timeout indicates a in large amount of congestion. Loss due to duplicate acts, a smaller amount of congestion. With a smaller amount of con which one first? With a smaller amount of congestion, that is three duplicate acts, how do we respond? OK, we're increasing our sending rate or our window. We lose one packet. There's a packet loss due to three duplicate acts. What we do is we halve our threshold. It was originally at 16,000, we cut it down to 8,000. And reduce our sending rate down to that threshold. And we don't go into slow start, we go immediately into additive increase phase and start increasing. We see we don't drop so far compared to the next case. That is, we don't decrease our sending rate as much as we do when we have a loss due to a timeout. Because we think there's not so much congestion because of the loss due to three duplicate acts. So the algorithm halve the threshold, reduce our window to that threshold, the new value, additive increase. Until sometime later, if we get one more packet loss. In this case, it's a loss due to a timeout. In this case, we again halve the threshold. It was previously 8,000. We reduce it down to 4,000. But we drop our sending rate down to the minimum. 
which is usually one maximum segment size, down to the initial value. We basically start from the start of the connection again, go down to the minimum, start slow start until we reach the threshold and then additive increase. So this point we're using the same approach as here. Start at the minimum, slow start, additive increase, minimum, slow start, additive increase. The only difference is that our threshold is smaller here. We'll move into additive increase earlier. So that's a summary of what you should know about TCP. It's important because this sending rate, or the window size, is normally proportional to our sending rate, which is proportional to our throughput. The larger the window, the higher our throughput. And because many applications use TCP, and we care about throughput for our applications, TCP congestion control has a large impact on performance, on throughput. And that's what your assignment will be about, or the third phase, third and final phase of the assignment, of studying some of those factors that impact on performance. So that's a recap of what we covered on TCP. It's more complex in practice. TCP congestion control, the algorithm works well. The algorithm, the parts that we've gone through, there are more extensions. That is, we haven't covered everything. There are different algorithms that improve due to, uh, under different scenarios. When we lose multiple packets in a row, how do we respond? We haven't touched upon that. But in general, the algorithm is considered to work well in most networks in the internet. Because in the internet, in most cases, a packet loss is due to congestion. In, uh, in some networks, where packet losses are due to, for example, link errors, especially wireless networks, maybe your network from your mobile phone to the base station or your laptop to an access point where you may send something across the wireless link and there's a lot of interference so your packet may be dropped across that link it has nothing to do with congestions, congestion at routers it's just to do that, that poor link quality this would be a packet lost due to some link error not due to congestion the problem with TCP is that it still responds in the same way as if it's congestion. It slows down. So if we start to lose packets across our wireless link, because we have a poor quality wireless link, then TCP will slow down and our throughput will go down. That's a problem in some cases. It's not the appropriate response. And sometimes you may ex experience that if you try to transfer a large file across a wireless link, which is not a strong quality link, then the throughput over time can degrade. Because if you lose a packet over a single connection, look what happens. If we don't lose packets, we slow start, additive increase, we achieve a good throughput. As we lose packets, we drop our sending rate and our throughput. The more packets we lose, the lower the threshold goes down and the lower we start from in our sending rate. So over a long file transfer, over a long time, if we look at the average across time, the more packets we lose, the lower the average throughput will be. So a long file transfer where we start to lose multiple packets across the wireless link due to some interference, someone else transmitting, causes problems for TCP. So in some links, TCP doesn't perform so well. It's not as good as it could. And there are some other cases where there are very high speed networks, not necessarily wireless links, optical fiber links, very high speed. There are some other problems with, even if there are very few packet losses, just a one packet loss mean, can mean TCP is very inefficient. But in general, TCP works well uh, in the internet. 
and is used by most applications that want reliable data delivery. The algorithms we've gone through are the basics. They're extensions and improvements and they've varied over time. Originally TCP was described by which standards organisation? There was a question in the exam about who, which standards organisation creates Ethernet and WiMAX? <laughs> Some people said IIEF, IFTE, <laughs> just try to guess the different letters with I and E. In the exam, the answer was IEEE, create Ethernet, wireless LAN, WiMAX, IEEE. 802.3, 802.11. The organization, their name is IEEE. The internet protocols, IETF. The Internet Engineering Task Force. So TCP was standardized by the IETF and the, in, in IEEE we see numbers like, let's get a better color, we see the standards names, okay, we have the name of the organisation and then some number to indicate the standard, 802.3, 802.11 yeah. and many others. Not just for Wi-Fi and other, other technologies, 1394, what's that? Firewire, if it still exists. Many other standards that IEEE create, not just in communications, many other fields, elect electronics, electrical engineering. IETF publishes, instead of giving the numbers like this, they're called requests for comments. RFC. And then some number. So you may see that in literature. RFC 793. It refers to some document, some standard. Or, or in some cases a standard, sometimes it's just for information. So for TCP the original standard was RFC 793, so that's what, 30 years ago. That didn't have any congestion control. Then there were improvements to add the congestion control, the slow start mechanism, additive increase, fast retransmit, the three duplicate acts, and that was referred to Tahoe, Reno, had improvements uh, and there are various improvements both to the congestion control and to other parts of TCP over time. And there are many more than what I've listed here. New Reno is perhaps one of the more popular ones in use today but again that's been extended as well. And there are different options. So different operating systems may implement different variations of TCP. They all will interoperate, but the performance may differ slightly in, in different conditions. And in fact, in some operating systems, you can choose the algorithms to use. You can select which congestion control algorithm is most appropriate for you. Uh, in Linux operating system, if I can remember, you can see the algorithms. Where? There's some options for the operating system as to uh, what algorithms are possible. I have to remember where they are. In some directory which is in fact not, is part of the directory where the configuration of the operating system and the kernel is, is stored. Similar to in Windows you have the, what is it called? Registry. You have the registry in Windows where you have many different options. In Linux under the, the slash proc directory there's many different options that you can view and edit. One of them for IP version 4, for the internet protocol. The options are just in files. So these are just files for different options. 
and something we see, all right, you cannot see the T, but this is TCP congestion control. If we look in that file, unfortunately you cannot see the left hand side. In my operating system, the congestion control algorithm being used at the moment is called cubic. So it's something different from what we've seen. It's a variation of the algorithms that we've gone through. So, and there are many other options for TCP that can be set and modified by just modifying the contents of these files. This is just a text file with some parameter value in it. This is the parameter name. This is the current value. And there may be one more op TCP available congestion control. There are two algorithms available on my computer right now, Cubic and Reno. So Reno is one that we've mentioned, which is one of the older ones. So Cubic is, is an improvement upon that. So I can switch between the two different algorithms by modifying those parameters. And there are other parameters which are related to TCP regarding, regarding the window size, uh, memory, um, and many different options. Anything else that we can recognize there? some option regarding to when to do slow start. And other, most of the others are re regarding window sizes and memory allocation. So with an operating system, you can sometimes select the algorithm to use for TCP congestion control and change parameters. So that covers all we want to cover on TCP congestion control. The last thing we want to mention, and just briefly, without going through uh, any algorithms, is just to mention the concept of TCP fairness. And you'll explore a little bit of that in the assignment. What do we mean? When we spoke about TCP so far, we're just talking about one, what's called session. My computer. An application on my computer creates a TCP connection to some server, transfers data. The speed at which it transfers data is controlled or managed by the congestion control and advertise and, and the wind flow control mechanism and the retransmission. So we just, that algorithm is per connection. If I create another connection to some other server at the same time, then I have a different instance of that algorithm. So I don't use the same windows. Each connection has its own set of parameter values, its own set of uh, window values, uh, buffers and so on. So we can talk about a TCP connection or sometimes called a session. What happens when we have multiple sessions? Here's an example. We have three hosts, oh, six hosts, three source hosts and we're going to have three destination hosts. So our clients and our servers and some routers. So a very simple network where all, so the top client on the left is going to create a TCP connection to the top client on the right and there'll be another connection from this client to this client on the right and the bottom client to the bottom client. We'll see what happens when we create three different connections at the same time. So the green, blue and red, they create connections and start transferring data. We have what's called a bottleneck link. In this internet, there's one link which all three connections pass through. 
And let's assume that this is the bottleneck link in the path in that it's the lowest rate. Imagine that this is our Ethernet link, 100 megabits per second. So are these links, 100 megabits per second. These may be also Ethernet, 100 megabits per second. This one has a capacity or a data rate of 1 megabit per second. Okay? So for the red path from this host to this host, all of the links in the path are, have a capacity or a data rate of 100 megabits per second except the bottleneck which has a capacity of 1 megabit per second, for example. And same for each of the paths. That's our scenario. These are three TCP connections the way that TCP works under ideal conditions, if everything's the same, that each connection will share that bottleneck link. That is, they'll apply their congestion control algorithm, start sending, and under, if everything's the same, that is the same packet sizes, they're sending, uh, start sending at the same time, then each, if this is a one megabit per second bottleneck link, each session will achieve a throughput of a th one third of that bottleneck, 330 kilobits per second each. That is, they'll share that link between the three sessions. So in that perspective, TCP is fair amongst the connections. Each connection gets the same, equal sharing. With n TCP connections using an R bit per second link, in our case we had three TCP connections using a one megabit per second link, then we say TCP is fair if each connection gets R divided by n bits per second, gets an equal share of that link capacity. So TCP is fair if that's true. Is it true in practice? In ideal conditions, when everything's the same, it generally is true. If three people start TCP connections at the same time using a single bottleneck link, they'll all get about the same performance. Ideal conditions means that the connections uh, have about the same round trip time and the segments that the sources are sending are about the same size. It may be different if, instead of the example we have on this slide, that we had one of the source and destination pairs were communicating across a long path with a large round trip time, maybe from one side of the world to the other, and another pair sharing this bottleneck link had a much shorter path and a short or small round trip time. That will be the case, or that could be a case where TCP between the two different connections may get different throughputs because they're not the same conditions. If the conditions are the same in terms of the round trip time and the segment sizes, then TCP gives a fairness amongst connections. If they're not the same, we have one computer communicating just across tens of meters over a very small round trip time path and another pair across hundreds of kilometers with a large round trip time, then maybe this one will get more performance than this one. But in, under the same conditions, TCP is considered fair amongst connections. But in practice, round trip time of connections vary. Even for one connection, the round trip time may go up and down during the connection. It may change during the connection. So it's not that simple. One thing that also impacts upon what throughput TCP gets is whether there's other traffic in the network, non-TCP traffic. 
and the main form of non-TCP traffic is UDP traffic. Two primary transport protocols, TCP and UDP, there are a couple of other ones but they're not as common. There, if there's UDP traffic in the network, then that may impact upon TCP's performance. TCP is considered fair amongst connections, but not necessarily fair. That doesn't mean fair between applications. We have our same three source computers sending to the same three destination computers. They're all using TCP, but the application on this top source computer creates two parallel TCP connections to the destination. So from the network's perspective and at this bottleneck link, we have four TCP connections passing the bottleneck. If TCP is fair amongst connections, each connection gets one quarter of the capacity. That is, if this bottleneck link has a capacity of one megabit per second, then on average, the red connection will get 250 kilobits per second, the blue one 250, and each of the green connections 250. Because TCP is fair amongst connections. From the perspective of the applications, the application on the red computer gets 250 kilobits per second, the application on the blue computer gets 250 kilobits per second, and the application on the green computer gets 500 kilobits per second. That's not fair amongst applications because one is getting, one application is getting more of the network bandwidth or the network capacity than the other two applications. So, what's an example of an application that, that does this? Web browsers in some cases may, will create, well, they will create multiple TCP connections. BitTorrent, file sharing applications often create, or will always create multiple TCP connections. Not always are they going to the same destination. What about, so there are applications that will do that. They won't necessarily, well, they will not always be creating connections to the same destination, but there's nothing to stop you from writing an application or using an application from doing that. Just create two connections, and in this scenario, your application on this computer will get twice as much performance as the other people's applications. That's a problem because we, as the end user, want to get high performance. Therefore, I will use an application like a download manager that creates. 10 TCP connections. Instead of two, I create 10, one, 10 connections at the same time. I get 10 times the performance as you do. What are you going to do if you're the blue computer? OK, I'm the green computer. I've just created 10. You can't control my computer. You're the blue computer. What are you going to do? You're getting. OK, you create 20. <laughs> then I'm only using 10. Then you get twice as much as me. OK, you're the red computer. What do you do? Create 30. Create more. So there becomes some competition. And it doesn't, in the end, eventually benefit anyone. Because ev everyone just keeps increasing the connections. And if we all use 30 connections, we all get the same. Every connection has some small overhead. The more connections we use, the more overhead there is, and the more complexity. So in theory, there's nothing to stop an application from having multiple connections, and some do. In practice, uh, you need to make, or application developers need to make some trade-offs in terms of being fair amongst other users and getting good performance for their application. Maybe this is 
the up or this is the link for the internet service provider. So here's an ISP's network. The ISP controls this link. It sees the ISP has three customers, green, blue and red. They all pay the same amount. The ISP controls this link, monitors the traffic going through. It sees that the green customer is creating many connections. It starts blocking them so that it's fair to its other customers. That's one practical way to reduce the problem of the end user using multiple connections to increase their performance, but it impacts upon other users. That's the problem. So maybe an internet service provider could control that and if it can recognize that some customers are creating multiple connections, limit the number of connections that they allow through. Limit to 10, no more than 10, for example. Most applications may have reasonable defaults in terms of the number of connections that uh, they create automatically. But there's nothing to stop the end user from modifying the application or modifying those default values. So, TCP, uh, TCP is considered fair amongst connections. Under the same conditions, if you have multiple connections sharing the same bottleneck link, the capacity of that bottleneck link will be shared amongst the connections, shared equally. In practice, sometimes we don't always have the same ideal conditions. We may have varying round trip times, varying packet sizes, so that we may not get equal sharing among connections. TCP is not fair amongst applications. It's only fair amongst connections. There's nothing to stop an application from using multiple TCP connections and gaining some advantage. What's the last thing to say? Any questions on TCP fairness? We're not going to explain much more, just that basic concept. Any questions on TCP at all? So you can get 20 out of 20 for the last part of your assignment instead of one and a half out of five. So almost summarizing what we know about TCP and the internet, the IP, the internet protocol, doesn't have congestion control built in. The internet protocol we know is very simple, just send datagrams, no retransmissions, no congestion control. In the internet, we rely on TCP mechanisms for congestion control. If TCP had no congestion control, then the internet would have collapsed in terms of too much congestion a long time ago. That is, you would not, not be able to send data because everyone would send too much. So TCP contributes to the managing the congestion in the internet. TCP comprises a large amount of the traffic in the internet. Of the transport protocols, TCP is the most used. The numbers vary over time, so, but maybe around 90% of all traffic on the internet uses T TCP as opposed to UDP and others. <coughs> and it's been very successful. It's been around for 30 years and probably will be used for, for a number of years in the future. But there are still some problems in, in today's applications and, and for today's users. If you write an application and modify uh, or modify the source code for TCP to not follow the congestion control rules, it may be a benefit for your application. That is, if you modify TCPs on your computer so that you don't do slow start, you just immediately start very high. Gives you good throughput. That's good. But you may contribute to congestion which may impact upon your application later and impact on other people's applications. So if you don't follow the rules, 
that can give you some short-term and sometimes even long-term benefit for you, but may impact upon others. Some challenges that are arise, web browsers create nowadays many TCP connections at once. How to manage more TCP connections for better performance, but less to be fair to others. There's some trade-off there. There's a growing number of applications that don't use TCP, that use UDP, for example, which has no congestion control. And that will impact upon TCP applications. And more, there's a growing number of applications that use multiple connections and or UDP, peer-to-peer -peer applications, for example, BitTorrent and so on. So they all impact upon congestion and performance in the internet. So that finishes on TCP and leads us to what are you going to do in the assignment for the last phase. We'll have a look at the assignment first, but let's talk about the phase two of the assignment. Any questions? Everyone's seen their comments? You should be able to see the PDF files, and in there there are some comments, and of course the scores. We'll have a look in a moment. Let's keep things simple and go through some of the issues that arose in the phase two and see how you can improve them. If I put these four letters on the screen, what do you think about? You think about wireless? Yes, good. What else? More specific? What are these four letters, A, B, G, N, relate to? Physical layer, wireless, wireless LAN. Data rate. They are variations of the IEEE 802.11 standard. So the standard is 802.11, the base standard, and it's been improved over time. And the numbers or the, the identifiers to indicate variations, they add a letter to the end. 802.11a, b, c, and so on. Different letters for different modifications. These four uh, modifications mainly about improving the data rate, the physical layer. Which one's fastest? No, easy. Which one's slowest? What's the B? In fact, A and B were released about the same time. B had a data rate of around 11 megabits per second, A maximum data rate of 54 megabits per second. But B became the most popular. Which one did you use in your assignment? Are you sure? No one said, hardly anyone said in the assignment which one they used. I think one group did. And in fact, one group did some tests and compared one against the other. They compared the performance of using 11G against using 11B. 11G offers, offers a data rate of 54 megabits per second maximum. B, 11 megabits per, per second. So one group did performance tests comparing them, which was nice to see. Note that they offer a maximum data rate, but also lower data rates. Which data rate did you use in your assignment? If you used 11G, what data rate did you use? Did you check? You should check and make sure that when you create a connection, that, or the, when you are transferring your data, that you are using the data rate that you think you are. The way that it works in practice is that the better the link quality, the higher the data rate. 
and the client and access point will choose the highest data rate possible. If your link quality is low, you will not be achieving or you will not be using 54 megabits per second for 11G. You may be using 48, 36, you may be even drop down to 1 megabit per second. So just be careful when you do your experiments that you know exactly what data rate and what physical layer technology you're using. What about those letters? What do they remind you of and make you think about? IPERF. Okay. UDP. So you, done a, you did a lot of tests using IPERF. So how many tests did you do? About how many tests did you do in your assignment? 5, 10, 50? More than 50? Some people did hundreds of tests. You used iPerf many times. So you're experts on these options. And when you have an exam question, it should be burnt in your brain how to write down iPerf. Okay? You used U to specify the tra transport protocol. It defaults to TCP, but in this phase we just wanted to use UDP, so use the minus U option. With UDP, there's no flow control, congestion control. UDP sends as fast as the application sends data. So if we draw our stack and compare, here's our application, here's TCP, here's our application as an alternative UDP, Application sends data very fast. Let's say, because the application is generating data, it sends it uh, uh, to TCP. The rate at which TCP sends out is controlled by our window, which depends upon the congestion control, uh, flow control, retransmissions. So it doesn't matter how fast the application sends to TCP, TCP controls how fast it sends. The application has no control over how fast TCP sends, where our application is iperf. With UDP, application sends data to UDP, UDP sends it immediately after a little bit of processing. UDP doesn't change the sending rate. Therefore, when you run a UDP test using the minus U option, you need to specify how fast the application sends to UDP. And it's called by iperf the bandwidth, the minus B option. That's why you set, by default, it's one megabit per second, but you can set it to some other value, which says the application sends to UDP at 20 megabits per second, and UDP will send out at 20 megabits per second and send out onto the network. Of course, not all will arrive at the destination, not necessarily. And that's what your test was. Keep increasing the rate at which we send. At some point, the network here has some capacity. Our link has some capacity, how much it can send. If we keep increasing the amount at which we send, we'll reach that capacity. And that will be indicated by the throughput, the amount which we receive. So you discover the capacity of wide land to be what? Ethernet capacity? In your assignment, can anyone remember? Approximate, what was the maximum throughput you could achieve over Ethernet? 90 something, 95, 96, 97, some were a bit lower, so that's okay. So with Ethernet, what's the data rate for Ethernet? The data rate. So distinguish between data rate and throughput. Where data rate, think of the physical layer specification, the capacity. Throughput is the amount of data we receive. 100 megabits per second. Has, who's done the lab on Monday? Some people? What was the data rate that you, ch that you used for Ethernet? And some have done the quiz. 
what was the data rate that you got for Ethernet in the first test? Computer to computer, one gigabit per second. Most likely your tests with laptops, your laptops support gigabit Ethernet if they're within the last two or three years, for sure they do. Why didn't your test use gigabit Ethernet? Your laptop, assuming it supported gigabit Ethernet, highly likely it did. That is, the LAN card in your laptop supports gigabit Ethernet, and the receiving laptop or computer, gigabit Ethernet, most likely. Why didn't you achieve data rates of 900 megabits per second? Sorry? The router. And people have done the uh, lab would have seen that, that the router only supports 100 megabit per second. So even though your laptop may support gigabit Ethernet, your router only supports 100 megabits per second. So when you give the specifications or the parameters of your experiment set up, you need to mention these details because, we'll see later, you need to be able to reproduce the results. Minus T, what's that for? Did anyone try it? Not many. The time. Your test runs for 10 seconds by default. Set the minus T option and it can run for a longer time or a shorter time. That's useful because, especially with TCP, the duration of the connection may have some impact on performance. This letter, what do you think it means? Your grade, if you don't improve. If you don't improve on your assignment, if you don't improve in your final exam, what about this letter? <laughs> this is an indicator that in your assignment especially, when you do some experiments and you get some results, you need to ask yourself and then write the answers down, why did this happen? Okay? Why did you get these results? So you'll see in almost all of the assignments or reports that were submitted, you got a throughput of 97 megabits per second for Ethernet. Why 97? Why not 100? Why not 80? And you got a throughput for wireless LAN of something like, what, 25 megabits per second? data rates 54 megabits per second, why? Especially why is there such a discrepancy between Ethernet and wireless LAN? As an example, Our, your wired experiments, Ethernet had a data rate or support a data rate of 100 megabits per second. You got a throughput of say 95. That is 95% efficient. Wireless LAN supports a data rate of 54 megabits per second. Let's say you got a throughput, most were slightly less, of 27. 50% efficient. <coughs> Not only is this smaller than this, that absolute value is, all right, the data rate, we don't expect more than 54, but this is much less efficient. Why? Why are the results as the, you see them? You need to always ask that question and give some discussion at the end of the results. I think you've seen this. This just shows that one of the main things that went, were missing in, some, in the reports, the equipment specification, not, not too bad, even though there are some red crosses here. There's just, that was just a minor point. But if you say, this is my laptop, and you give me the manufacturer of the RAM, the CPU, 
the screen, the screen size, the DPI of the screen, but you don't say what wireless technology it supports, then that's not very useful because in this experiment we care about the network interfaces. So, and especially whether it's 802.11a, b, g or n in terms of the equipment spec. Parameters. Hardly anyone gave parameters. I don't think anyone said that they used 802.11g, 54 megabits per second. I'll say more about that in a moment, why it's important. All right, the iperf commands weren't so important, but again, I'll say more about why you need to include this shortly. Many people did, mul or some people did multiple tests. That is, they ran the same experiments three times and took the average. If you didn't do that, then, well, the advantage of doing that is that sometimes you do an experiment and the result you get has been impact, impacted by different factors. Maybe someone else was transmitting at the same time. If you run the test again and again and again, you can statistically be more confident that the result you get, the average result, for example, is a reflection of what's happening in rea reality. So running multiple tests for the same scenario is of a benefit. Most people did three, four or five tests, which is probably enough. The plots, most cases, okay. Be careful when you show a plot that you have the right labels on the axes. Uh, most people got good values for the throughput, reasonable values. There's no right or wrong value except some people didn't run the tests. Say for the wired LAN, they should have ran the tests up to 100 megabits per second. I think that was the, the main problems. Explanations, no one said why. A couple of people started to give explanations but they didn't really complete or give strong enough reasons as to why. Uh, some people did some extra things. Let's mention them. Some group, one group tried the impact of RTS thre threshold, changed the RTS threshold and see how that impacts on performance. And the other thing was that they reversed their client and server. You'd think it makes no difference. You've got two laptops. One is, one's a two-year-old laptop, one's a three-year-old laptop. This is the iPerf client, this is the iPerf server, you run your tests. They reversed them, that is they made the three-year-old laptop the client and the two-year-old laptop the server, ran the same tests and they got different results. Maybe within about three or four megabits per second different throughput. So in practice, the device does have some impact on performance. Now you didn't have to do that, but it gave an interesting result. Some people, one group tried a longer test instead of just 10 seconds, 60 seconds. Come back to this one. Uh, okay, uh, someone gave some plot of signal strength to indicate that the channel that they were using in that experiment, that there wasn't many other access points around using that same channel to, to show that there's not going to be interference from other users. That's useful. One group tried and compared 11B versus 11B, uh, 11G, and also a mix of a B and G, and see how that impacted on performance, which was nice. One group had some scripts to automate the running of the experiments. You said you had hundreds of experiments. So instead of typing in the same command 100 times, waiting for 10 seconds for it to complete then press enter again for the next command. They had a simple script that ran the 100 experiments one after the other. Run the experiment, go, go away, browse YouTube, do whatever you like on another computer, come back one hour later and you have all the results there. So you can have a look and see group 5's report and you'll see their script in there. I'm sure they'll be happy if, if you make use of their script or even improve upon it. Helps managing your experiments. So some things that you summarize some of this and also help you improve in the 
the final report. When you do any experiment and you report on that experiment, then you want to be able to, be able to pr produce reproducible results. That is, think that you write your report, students come along next year, given just your report, they should be able to run the same experiments from reading your report and get the same set of results. That's why I say when you say about the equipment specification, the parameters that you used, if you give, you should give enough details such that they could read that, okay, they see that they used a computer which was a, a this specification that used 802.11 G, 54 megabits per second, these parameters set to these values. They just recreate those conditions, run the experiments, and they should get approximately the same results. So when you ask yourself what to include in the report about parameters, about equipment specs, think about what would others use to be able to reproduce this experiment. Any questions on how to do that? So use that basic concept, which applies to all experiments, to think about what to go in that section on equipment spec and on parameters. This is, you want to produce accurate results. How do you produce accurate results? One way is to repeat the experiments. So instead of running it just once, run it three times, take the average of the three values. And that may give you a more, ac the average may be a more accurate representation of j than just a single value. How do you know how many times to repeat? Do you repeat three times, five times, or 500 times? In general, the more times you repeat, the more accurate the average will be, but the longer it takes you. So there are statistical ways to look at the accuracy of the results, the confidence intervals, the standard deviation, and so on. But at least in, in these, this assignment, three, four, five repetitions should be sufficient. One practical way to see is, if you run three times, and the first time you run you get five megabits per second, the next time you run at five, and the next time you run you get 25, that to me indicates something's gone wrong. You've got three values, one of them's way off. It's a big difference from the other two. That would suggest that maybe on that one, either you did something wrong or there's some other conditions having some impact. You either run more, run another five and see that they're all five, 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 five and maybe ignore that 25 or see what conditions may have impacted upon that, that individual experiment. So running more tests can give more accurate results. But you need to make a trade-off and not spend years running the test. Most people presented the results okay. Uh, basically give a plot. Some people gave tables, which is fine. I just made a note, just to make it easier for me to read your report, put the tables in an appendix, the tables of data. So then I can read the report quicker and if there, I have questions about the results in the plots, so I can then look at the data in the tables. The plots show a, uh, sh should show the trend of performance. They should show how some parameter, when it changes, impacts on the performance. In your case, the performance was throughput and the parameter was the sending rate. And we could see in your plots that you increased the ascending rate and the throughput went up and then it flattened out. That's what most plots showed, which was fine. If you have different parameters in phase three, you use different parameters, not just the sending rate, then you may need multiple plots, one for each parameter on the uh, x-axis. But most people were okay with plots. One group had a plot which the right data, but they just made the plot too small. And I think one group 
didn't include labels on the plots, the units and so on. And why? Summarize the results and then explain why the results are as they are. By summarize, I mean the something like the results showed, or the, these experiments showed that the maximum throughput over our wireless link was 27 megabits per second. So make that point. Even though your results have a plot showing values, make it in the text saying the maximum throughput, which is what your aim was. You all wrote an aim to find out about the maximum throughput. So in after the result, the plots give some text that says the maximum throughput is approximately 27 megabits per second. And then explain why it's 27 megabits per second. Why not 54? Why not 100? Sometimes the explanations are very simple. Sometimes it's not so obvious. And that will be especially so in the next assignment, or the next phase. Is there any more? No. I'll show you the, the next phase in a moment. Any questions about phase two and how you're going to improve upon it in terms of writing the report? They don't need to be much longer than, or presented much differently than what most of you did. Just a few more parameters and a little bit more discussion of why the results are as they are. Same username and password for, what is it, Steve S-I-T, for everyone. So last phase of the assignment. Now look at the performance of TCP in the same network scenario. So your tasks design a set of experiments that will, mo will most likely demonstrate the main factors that impact upon the throughput in a wireless LAN and or Ethernet with regards to transport protocols. In task, in phase two, you look just about the maximum throughput using UDP. Now let's look at what happens when we introduce TCP and what are some of the parameters, both for the wireless link, for TCP, uh, for the network scenario that will change the throughput, will impact upon throughput. You need to design and se select a set of experiments. I list the most likely ones you can do here. We'll say about how many you can do, but let's mention them first. For example, do some experiments that compare the performance of TCP versus UDP. You've done the UDP tests. You know the maximum throughput. What's the maximum throughput when you use TCP in the same conditions? Do you get 95 and 27? There's a simple test. Looking just at TCP, compare TCP over your wired network and over your wireless network. How does it differ? You may want to set up the networks to, to use the same data rates. You could almost do that, or you could just simply look at the, the percentages. You can select the data rate of your Ethernet down to 10 megabits per second. Unfortunately, you cannot set wireless to 10. You could set it to 11 megabits per second data rate. Be close. Or you can simply look at the, the efficiencies and see how does TCP perform over Ethernet versus over wireless LAN. And some other things about TCP performance, either in a wireless LAN or in Ethernet, not necessarily both. What happens when packets are dropped on TCP performance? We'll come back to that one and how to create packet drops. What if you change some of the parameters on your operating system or in iPerf to use different window sizes? 
we saw three parameters for iperth, minus u, minus b, minus t. There are others. One of them is, re or some of them are related to window size. Can you change some parameters to get a different throughput, better throughput? With TCP, how does it perform related to the bandwidth delay product? We haven't mentioned the de bandwidth delay product yet. Uh, and we won't do it today. There's some description in the handouts. There's an extra handout on bandwidth delay product. We may mention it after a week or so of you trying on the assignment. But basically, what happens to TCP when you change the throughput of the, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the data rate of the link and the round trip time of the link, the delay across the link? How does the delay across the link impact upon the TCP throughput? Can you try different congestion control algorithms with TCP and see how they impact on performance? Don't just run one iperf session, run three parallel iperf sessions. So that you have three TCP connections at once. Do you get fairness amongst those connections? What if you use different parameters? Do you get fairness? Have some UDP sessions mixed with TCP sessions. How's the performance of each? Try different durations of TCP, or download, or uh, which is equivalent to transferring a large amount of data. What happens if you run a TCP session for 10 seconds versus 10 minutes? And some combinations of these. You can, what happens when you change parameters of TCP, of wireless LAN, RTS threshold, other parameters? You can choose. You don't have to do all of these. How many? There's no one answer, but I would expect probably around three of those would be good, would be minimal. So the, you don't have to analyze all of these. You may analyze two or three and analyze them in depth. That is, if you choose this one, impact of different congestion control algorithms, and you try five different algorithms, or maybe two algorithms with different parameters, that would be good, plus one or two others. But if you do this one and just use two algorithms, run the tests, they take, you just run two tests, then maybe that's needs to be combined with multiple other ones. That is, some of them you can do in more depth than others. So there's no one answer as to how many you need to do, but select some, start trying some, and the point is to see, find the parameters that have a large impact on performance. If you do tests and you get results, that look like this, you measure the throughput. On this axis, you plot the different parameter values. Let's say parameter 1, or, or value 1, 2, 3, 4, and the throughput looks like this, then I would conclude that that parameter doesn't impact upon throughput. And it's not so interesting. So if you present three results like that in your report, you will not get a high grade. You may get zero. Because although you run, may run this test and you may present it, you will then make a conclusion, this parameter doesn't impact upon throughput. Let's try a different test and find some parameter that does, that looks like this, for example then we can make a conclusion changing this parameter according to the red line we get a linear increase in throughput therefore that parameter does impact upon throughput so you need to try try some to find out which ones are the most appropriate to use take your existing report so just take the existing document add the results improve it and submit the existing, uh, the, the final report. And do so by the 22nd of March, about three weeks.
Any questions on how you're going to get a better score for your assignment? <laughs> if you don't get a better score, if you still get, what, 20 or, well, 20 percent, then that's when you may be in that bottom group at the end of the semester. And as I mentioned to a few of you as you walked in, the average in the midterm was 42 percent. Last year was 60 percent. So last year was much higher. Maybe different reasons, different exam, different group of students. And different group of students. And the year before was 49. So this year has been the lowest in the midterm of the last of, of the, this and the previous two years. Different reasons like shorter semester, different exam, but it may give you an indicator that uh, the other point was that in the last two years there have been zero F's in 2010 and zero F's in 2009. If you don't improve, that doesn't mean there won't be zero F's in 2011. So there doesn't need to be any F's, but if you get two out of 20 for the assignment and you had a bad exam score, then your chances are not so high of avoiding F. But if you go okay in the assignment and improve a bit on the final exam, you should be okay. Any questions on the past fa phase of the assignment and the next phase? There's not m too many more guidelines, you just need to try think about some of them and start trying them. Uh, we won't discuss now, but maybe next week we'll give some demonstrations more of iPerf, but you can try them. How do you drop packets? There's some discussion from the links here, which are really from last year and the year before, of how to drop packets and how to do other things on your link. Um, some of these are relevant, some are not. How to, how yeah, you, if you log into the mailing list, I think it gives you an opportunity to reset your, not log in, um, okay. How do you access those mail archives? You need your password for the mailing list. If you go to this, the mailing list website, you can get a password reminder. I think you just put in your email address that you subscribe with and you, it will send you a reminder. It will send an, a password to that uh, email address. So that's how you get your password. Any other questions? The next topic. Do you have the handout for bandwidth delay product? Could I include it in the printout? Yes. Can I have a look? We'll go through bandwidth delay product now since we only have 15, 20 minutes. It's enough time. Let's, so this is still on TCP. It's something I forgot uh, that you'll need for the assignment. In 
magnate. The bandwidth delay product is a concept that you may hear or you will see and it has an impact upon the performance of TCP or some relationship with the throughput for TCP. Let's explain that. So this handout is in your printout, so you have it there, it's written down. Let's go through the case to explain what is the bandwidth delay product. This is a, a diagram illustrating a simple example of sliding window, the basic sliding window mechanism where the client in this example sends four packets, four TCP segments and waits for an acknowledgement. So if the window allowed us to send four packets at a time, if each packet was 1,000 bytes, for example, and the window size was 4,000 bytes, then it means we can send 4,000 bytes or four packets. We send packet one, two, three, four. Then <coughs> because our window was 4,000, we've sent 4,000, we now are not allowed to send any more until we receive an act. That's the basic sliding window. Send your window size, wait for the ACK. The ACK allows you to send more. So in this example, we send four packets. Uh, the first packet is shown as a solid line and then the three subsequent packets, just to highlight one of the packets. The server receives the first packet, processes, sends back an ACK. And receives the second packet, processes, sends back an ACK. When the first ACK comes back, it means we can send more data. And in the basic sliding window, it means we can send one more packet. We transmit that packet, and at the time when we are finished sending that, the second ACK comes back, meaning we can send another packet. We send that, and then the third ACK, the fourth ACK, and if we follow, we just keep sending packets using this approach, then we see the, in this example, we send four packets. Then we must wait some time for the first act to come back. Then we can send another four packets, wait, and send the next four packets, and so on. And that will continue. That's just one example of the sliding window working where in this example the window is four packets in size. What's the round trip time in this case? Uh, let's come up with this equation. For a if we look at a single what's the round trip time? It's the time to get the packet there and the act back. So we can create write an equation for that. It depends upon the data size. The act size. The link data rate. Or the path rate. And the propagation delay. Simply the time to transmit the data <coughs> packet plus the time for the data packet to propagate to the other side, the time to transmit the ACK packet back, and the time for that ACK to propagate back. That's just our basics of total time is the transmission time plus the propagation time. And we have two different packets there. So given that equation, we'll come back to it. Let's calculate, using example, some performance metrics.
what's the value? If our packets are 1,000 bytes, and our round trip time we know is one millisecond, and do we have a in our example, what's our throughput? In this example, if our packet size is 1,000 bytes and our round trip time, which is this time, there was an equation for it down the bottom, but we don't need that. If we know the round trip time is one millisecond, our packet size is 4,000 bytes, how do we calculate the throughput in this case? in this figure. First, maybe try and calculate the sending rate. How many bytes per second are we sending? just draw the diagram again. At the start we transmit the first packet and then the second, the third and the fourth. Then eventually the first act comes back. If we see the pattern, we transmit four packets, the act comes back, another four packets, the act comes back, and so on. We'd keep doing that. We get to transmit this packet because the first act comes back, the next packet because the second act comes back, and so on. And after transmitting this fourth packet, we'll then have to wait for the act of <coughs> this packet to arrive back. So it's just drawing this diagram. Transmit four, wait for the act. Transmit four, wait for the act. The time from transmitting the first until you receive the first act is by definition our round trip time. That's the time for a packet to get there and back. So we are sending four packets every round trip time. So sending four packets in this example, 4,000 bytes every round trip time. Send 4,000 bytes, and then 4,000 bytes, and 4,000 bytes. If we keep going, then our average sending rate will be 4,000 bytes per round trip time of one millisecond is 32,000 bits. 32,000 bits is 32 megabits per second. That's the sending rate in this case. And what's the throughput? How many bytes per second are we receiving from the server side? Receive four packets, then there's some break. Receive another four packets, some break, and so on. The time between here and here is also a round trip time. We're receiving four packets per round trip time. The throughput is the same as the sending rate in this case. Or well, the receiving rate is the same as the sending rate. To be precise, the throughput would depend upon how big is the header in here. If there was a header in here, then our throughput would be slightly less than the sending rate. But assuming the header is very small, then this is also our throughput. The throughput is, and we've covered this before with TCP, depends upon the window size. In this example, four 
packets. That was the window that we could send divided by the round trip time. So, in fact, we covered this before the midterm. Sending rate is approximately the window size divided by the round trip time. In this example, the window size is 4,000 bytes or four packets. Another example. Uh, from also from this diagram, we could say that or we see that. How do we improve that throughput? How do we improve the throughput? How how do we get it higher? Yeah. All right. We have a window size, which is four in the example, divided by round trip time, increase the window size. If this is larger, this will be larger. Or round trip time, if round trip time is smaller, throughput will be larger. We don't have control over the round trip time, but still there's a relationship now between the window size and the round trip time and the throughput. This diagram simplifies the same as before, except now we've just removed the acts because the acts are normally quite small. Okay? The data is the main thing. But it, you see the same shape, the same pattern. We send a window size of packets, wait for the first act, send another window size of packets, wait for the first act, and so on. It's just we haven't, it doesn't show the, all the acts. And it assumes the acts are small, so the act transmission time is quite small in this case. Uh, ignoring congestion control, the window size depends upon the advertised window. There's the amount that we're allowed to send is the window size, or if the congestion control window is ignored, is simply the advertised window. The time it takes to transmit this window size is the advertised window divided by the rate. In my example here, the advertised window was 4,000 bytes. Therefore, the time to transmit 4,000 bytes is the size divided by the data rate. Our equation for round trip time is simply the data size divided by the rate plus two propagation delays, which is the same as this equation, equation one, except we've assumed the act size is small, so we just made that part zero. It's almost there what we're arriving at. Now let's compare and see what scenario gives us the best throughput. We've got these two different cases now, two different window sizes. The one on the left is what we've just seen where we sent four packets and because of the round trip time in this scenario we had to wait and then send another four. If our window was double, it was eight packets, then we'd give something like we see on the right side. We send one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight packets. When we receive the first act back, we're allowed to send another packet. Look when we receive the first act. Here we sent four packets. Because of the round trip time, the round trip time in this case was larger 
than the time to transmit the window size of frames, of packets. In this case, we transmit eight packets. The eighth is finished here. We receive the first act back before we finish transmitting those eight packets. When we receive the first pa act back, we're allowed to send an another packet, which is the ninth packet here. And we transmit that. And next, next. And we receive the act back, allowing us to transmit more. In this, the case on the left, the time to transmit the window size of packets, this time, is smaller than the round trip time. In the case on the right, the time to transmit the window size of packets is greater than the round trip time. And in that case, when it's greater than the round trip time, we get optimal performance. We're always transmitting. We're therefore always receiving, ignoring header overheads. The throughput is at the maximum in that case. There's no time spent waiting. This is an example of a window size of four. On the right is a window size of eight. If we change the window size to 16, it would look like the right-hand case. It doesn't give us any advantage because with 16, we transmit, we can still only transmit one at a time, one, two, three, four, up to 16, and immediately we're allowed to transmit the next one again because we've already received acts back. So there's some optimal value for the window size. Should be large enough such that the time to transmit that window size of packets is larger or greater than or equal to the round trip time. We can express that condition. Let's make it This time is the windows, the time is the window size divided by the rate, the sending rate. If our window in the example was 4,000 bytes, then the time at, then let's call this T1. T1 equals 4,000 bytes div divided by the time to transmit those 4,000 bytes. So T1 is the time to transmit a window size of packets. This time, the time from when we send the first until we receive the, the act for that first is round trip time, T2, for example. If this time is greater than the round trip time, then we'll be always transmitting packets and therefore always receiving packets and get optimal performance. If this time is less than the round trip time as it is in this example, then we spend some time, that's here, not transmitting. So we've got suboptimal performance. So if if this time is greater than or equal to the round trip time, we'll get optimal, optimal performance. So we express that as here. Here it's called the, the window, because we're just ignoring congestion control is the advertise window. I'll write the window. If the window divided by the rate is greater than or equal to the round trip time, then the performance is optimal. That's what we'd like. Rearrange that, just a simple rearrangement. We get the window.
if the window of packets we're allowed to send is greater than or equal to the rate which we can send times by the round trip time, so I just bring the rate to here, then we'll get optimal performance. This, the rate is referred to sometimes as the bandwidth of our network. The rate at which we can send, the bandwidth at which we, which we can send. The round trip time is the delay. And we get what's called the bandwidth delay product. It's the product of the bandwidth and the delay of the network. BDP, it's here, bandwidth delay product. If our window is greater than or equal to our bandwidth delay product, we'll get optimal performance for, from our sliding window perspective. So if, if the window uh, is much larger, so if it's equal to the bandwidth delay product, we get optimal performance. If it's greater than the bandwidth delay product, we still get optimal performance. We don't get any improvement in performance. So is there any ad advantage of that? Not really. Uh, having a larger window, not really, except in practice, this changes. I don't know what, this is, what the bandwidth delay product is. If I estimate that the round trip time is one millisecond in my network, then I can work out what the best size window is. It's equal to the rate times the round trip time, but this is not fixed. So therefore you may set the window to be larger to make sure you get it larger than the bandwidth delay product. In theory, if your bandwidth, if your window size is greater than the bandwidth delay product, you'll get optimal performance. But the bandwidth delay product is really used as an indicator of uh, the network conditions. It's not fixed. So. How do we control this size of the window? In TCP, it still depends on the congestion window and advertised window. And this depends upon the congestion control algorithm. This depends upon the receiver. So we don't have control over that other than the algorithms that we use and the receiver. But if it's greater than or equal to that, then that's when we get the best performance. Less than, if it's less than the bandwidth delay product, then the performance drops to the window size divided by the round trip time. So what we tried to arrive at there is what is the bandwidth delay product? It is simply the the bandwidth of our network, the rate at which we can send data, times by the delay of the network, the round trip time of the network. The window size, when we use a sliding window control, uh, sliding window flow control algorithm, if it's greater than the bandwidth delay product, we can get optimal performance, optimal throughput. If it's less than, then the throughput is dependent on the window size. You will see that, hopefully, when you do the assignment, because if you can, you know the capacity of your link, 100 megabits per second. Your Ethernet link, 100 megabits per second, that's your bandwidth. If you know the round trip time of your link is one millisecond, then the bandwidth delay product of your network is 100 million times 1 millisecond <coughs> 100 million times 1 milli is 100k 
kilobits. Is that right? 100 million divided by 0 0.001 is 100,000 bits. That's the bandwidth delay product. Therefore, if your window is larger than that, you'll get optimal performance. If it's less than that, you will not. In iPerf, you can control the window. And in the operating system, you can control the window at the receiver and see how it changes compared to the bandwidth delay product. Out of time for today. Have a read through that. We may say more with some examples.